Well, thank you, everybody. Welcome to uh, our event today. I, I hope you're joining us and are feeling healthy and staying healthy during this uh, certainly hard time. I'm Kelly Tuning. I'm one of the board members here in Boston for our uh, Conscious Capitalism chapter. I head up marketing and programming for our, our uh, chapter here. Um, I, I really do thank you for joining today's uh, inaugural virtual event. Uh, we've never done virtual events before, but um, are excited that we can still create a space for gathering and sharing and support during this very challenging time. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes just to get us started. First, everybody is muted for now. And uh, as you're joining, we are gonna have a Q&A section. And during that time, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can ask a question. Um, and then we'll also have a uh, small break uh, discussion group a little bit later. And so you'll be unmuted in that portion to be able to communicate with your fellow uh, small group attendees. Um, second, if you're having any trouble hearing uh, or seeing the speakers, I would recommend just uh, stopping your video. Sometimes reducing the bandwidth uh, will solve that issue. Third, um, if you uh, have any uh, issues or questions during um, any portion of it, feel free to uh, chat with me directly and I can try to help and uh, see if I can be of technical assistance for you during that time. Um, with those virtual items, uh, uh, those, uh, those housekeeping items out of the way, let me pass the virtual mic over to Bob Scovell, the president of the Boston chapter. All right, thanks, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Kelly did, I just also want to acknowledge the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all managing our way through. Certainly hope that you're all staying healthy and productive during this time. Uh, this meeting was intended to be in person, and we specifically chose not to cancel this, this session uh, because we believe that this topic is very important um, for our community and for business leaders. Uh, but we also wanted to create a space for connection and community and support in a challenging time. So we thank you all for being here. Uh, for our chapter, the Boston chapter of Conscious Capitalism, our purpose is to connect, educate, and inspire leaders and workers to consciously build businesses that positively impact the world. And we have a vision, and that vision is to foster the fundamental transformation of capitalism, to a healthy, balanced way of doing business for all people and the planet. And uh, my sense is that most of you, um, I recognize many of the names and faces on the line today, that many of you are familiar with conscious capitalism, but I'm just gonna offer a quick overview before we get started. So it's, uh, it is certainly a way of doing business and it's also a movement and it's centered around four tenets higher purpose, stakeholder orientation, conscious leadership, and conscious culture. And so higher purpose is really about a business having a reason for existence beyond making a profit. And stakeholder orientation is about creating value for all of those people um, that are touched by the business. So that includes employees, customers, vendors, the community, the environment, and of course, investors. Conscious leadership can be analogous to servant leadership, if you're familiar with that term. And among other qualities, it's characterized by selflessness, strength, flexibility, a long-term orientation, love, and caring. And caring and intentional cultures are the fourth tenet, and, and they're, the idea is that they're healthy, productive, and oriented towards learning. So if you wanna learn more about conscious capitalism, we encourage you to check out our website. And if you're interested, uh, we'd love to have you get involved as either a member or a volunteer. Uh, but on to our agenda today. Uh, first, I want to thank our three speakers for being here. Uh, Whitney Daly from Porter Novelli Cone, Mike Brady and Lucas Tanner from Grayston Bakery. 
Um, Whitney's going to share her thoughts on Porter Novelli Cohen's purpose study. And Mike and Lucas are going to be talking about how purpose has evolved at Grayston over time, how it's informed their decisions in the past, and certainly in today's unprecedented circumstances. Uh, we're going to do some Q&A. Uh, and then because we wanted to create that space for community and connection, we're also going to do breakout groups. So we're going to break you into uh, small groups of about eight to 10 people. And then uh, to close out, um, after the breakout groups, we'll come back together and offer a few closing comments. And we'll also actually be drawing three winners for a gift box of eight delicious brownies from Grayston Bakery. So uh, make sure you stick around to the finish so that you can be part of that drawing at the end. Uh, but with that, I will pass it back to you, Kelly, to introduce Whitney. Yes, thank you, Bob. And so let me just um, do one housekeeping thing here and stop sharing so that Brittany can, uh, so Whitney can share her, her slides. Um, so uh, Whitney is uh, VP of Marketing and Research and Insights from the uh, Porter Novelli and Cone firm that is here in Boston. And she is, uh, has been leading the purpose research at their company for uh, nine years now, but it's actually research that spans over 25 years of benchmarking and, uh, and data collection around purpose. So certainly a wealth of knowledge coming from her and her firm. Uh, Whitney specifically is uh, someone who believes business can and should be a force for positive change in the world. Uh, business has the acumen and speed and innovation to get things done. And she believes that if she can inspire just a single company to lead with purpose, she knows she's making an impact in the world. Um, so with that, I will pass the mic over to our first speaker, Whitney. And there she is. Okay. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kelly, and, and thank you, Bob, um, for having me today. Um, these are certainly um, very trying times and uncertain times right now, but appreciate that we can all get collectively together here online and be able to share some insights and information that hopefully will support um, all of the organizations on the line today. Um, and I know, you know, when we initially conceptualized this, this event, um, we were all going to be together in one space. I was going to share some of that benchmark data that Kelly alluded to. Um, but, you know, we got on the phone last week and, and really thought about what would be the best sort of content to share today. So I have pivoted my presentation um, to really arm everyone on the phone with, with some insights and examples that might be helpful given um, the current uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic situation. Um, so with that, um, this is a little bit of what I'm going to share today. Starting off with, you know, what does it mean to be a conscious business during a time of crisis um, and, and how does that impact how organizations are making decisions and, and how they're um, being viewed in society. Next, we'll talk about um, some of the company responses that we've seen to date um, to the current crisis and how different companies are stepping up and what areas and assets they're using to leverage um, to solve these challenges. Um, I'll quickly go over some nonprofits that we're seeing emerge in the space as, as quite active um, in case you are looking to form a partnership. And then I'll close with a few best practices from a communications perspective, um, both for external and in internal communication. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Porta Novelli on the line, um, we're a global purpose communications firm. Um, and we were really founded 45 years ago on this tenant that the art of communication can advance society. That is really what we are about, what drives us, um, and we help organizations find, live, and tell their purpose. Um, for many in the Boston area, you're probably familiar with Cone Communications. In 2017, Cone joined Porter Novelli um, as part of its global purpose practice, and, and we've been continuing to fuel the work that we do. Um, so with that, um, I think it's, you know, 
important to take a step back and really think about the time that we're in in today and, and what it means to lead with purpose. And I, I think the word unprecedented is, is pretty poignant. Um, if you look at media articles today, that's probably one of the most used words that, that we're seeing out there. And it certainly is unprecedented times. It certainly is not business as usual. Um, and I, I think that everyone on the, on the line is feeling that, not only from a business perspective, but certainly from a personal and familial perspective as well. Um, I don't think there has ever been a time where business, government, NGOs, and individuals are all collectively dealing with the same issue, the same challenge. Um, so we're really at a unique time where, where every single organization needs to be looking at this challenge from a humanity level, um, from a person to person level. And I think that is why it is so important for organizations to lead with purpose during this time. And I think that these times now and what we'll see over the coming weeks and months will really be a moment that will test the commitment of many organizations that are purpose driven um, and also test that authenticity in terms of how they're showing up in the space and how that is impacting the decisions that they're making and if they can really stay true to purpose being a lens through which all decisions are made. Um, and, and that certainly leads up to reinforcing that leadership and, and making sure that the decisions that we make today are decisions that, that we can feel good about. And in fact, the, the, the decisions that we're making today um, for brands, employees, and communities um, will really define these organizations after the pandemic has passed. Um, and this certainly is a time where organizations will build their legacies um, in the world. And so I, I don't think there, there is a better time to continue leading with purpose. Um, that is not to say that these are not challenging and difficult times, um, but I do believe that organizations that continue to lead with their values and continue to reinforce, reinforce those values um, will be rewarded by society. Um, as Kelly alluded to, we have years of benchmark data um, which back up this belief that businesses should lead with a purpose lens. Um, and they will be rewarded if they do so. Um, so here you see Americans uh, overwhelmingly will have a more positive image, be more likely to trust, and more loyal to organizations that lead with purpose. This is benchmark data that we have tracked all the way back to 1993. And these three data points here have been consistent over that time, really reinforcing that level of reputation that can really be built foundationally if you are able to take a purpose first approach. And in today's society, um, what we're seeing from a research perspective is that Americans really do feel a sense of urgency to support issues in every way that they can. And in fact, now more than ever, individuals feel that it is important to support companies that really align and reflect with those values. And that is going to lead to purchase along with a number of other actions. 86% of Americans say they would purchase a product from a company that leads with purpose. Um, we're seeing the same from an employment perspective. Individuals are seeking out uh, employers that lead with purpose, and that is really a lens that they're using to make decisions on where they want to work. Um, and in fact, we just launched Gen Z research in the fall, and that generation more than any other is seeing purpose as a decision factor in where they work. Um, so younger generations, this is going to be even more important to them. So with that, um, I'm going to turn to sharing some examples that we have collected in the marketplace over the past um, two to three weeks. Um, we have been extensively tracking this space to get an understanding of how companies are acting, where they're leading, what sorts of efforts are really breaking through and providing value to society. So that's what I'm going to share in a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and we bucket these into different themes that we're seeing in the marketplace um, so that we can really have an understanding of, of the different areas that companies are making the most impact. Um, so these are the different areas that I will be sharing over the next few slides um, and sharing specific examples that we're seeing in the marketplace. So first up, 
Um, changing operations to address needs. Um, this is really thinking about um, how your current product services, manufacturing lines, distribution systems can be repurposed to provide and solve for an urgent need in the marketplace. Um, we've seen a number of different companies stepping up in this area. I'm sure that you've seen them in the news every single day. A handful that we have on the screen here, AB InBev, no stranger to disaster relief efforts. Um, they have been working in this space for quite a while. Many of you may remember their 2017 Super Bowl commercial where the factory line worker is called in the middle of the night to come into work and transition their canning facility from beer to water. Um, we're seeing AB InBev step up here again, not only producing hand sanitizer, but also leveraging its distribution network and its understanding of really getting supplies across the US and even across the globe to get hand sanitizer quite literally into the hands of those that need it most. Um, we're also seeing a number of auto, automotive manufacturers stepping up and, and working with healthcare providers to increase ventilator output. Um, one of those is GM. We've obviously seen announcements from Ford and Tesla. GM is actually partnering with Ventec Life Systems. So they're not only helping to determine how they can increase ventilator output and if that's changing over manufacturing lines, but also kind of acting as a consultant with Ventec to be able to increase that production overall. And this last example um, from GG Hospitality, this is a UK hotel and hospitality group. Um, right now, they have closed all their hotels. They are not accepting guests at their hotels. So they quite literally have a lot of open beds. So they've decided to take those open beds and actually open up their hotels to hospital workers so that they can self-isolate outside of work um, and not put their family at risk um, of, of the coronavirus while they continue to provide um, life support for those in the hospital. So here we see companies just really thinking about how they can be innovative about what assets they have and, and what can be transitioned. Um, this can be as big as changing over our production line or as small as lending consulting support to a nonprofit or a healthcare organization. Um, next up, tried and true, very um, basic corporate social responsibility move here, right? Um, philanthropic efforts. However, in a time of disaster, um, lending money can be almost one of the most valuable things that an organization can do. So let's not discount how important these actions are. Um, a couple examples on the screen here. Giorgio Armani Group um, was actually one of the first organizations that we saw really jump up with a significant monetary donation, specifically to Italian hospitals and emergency funds. I think what's interesting here is that um, after Giorgio Armani made this move, um, they actually, we, we actually saw a number of other fashion brands and specifically Italian fashion brands take that note and, and make their own donations. Um, so because of this one move, a lot of organ other organizations are following in their footsteps and providing donations in Italy and other, organ uh, other countries. Um, next up is Miller Lite. Um, so they launched a virtual tip jar um, to support bartenders, which we obviously know those in the restaurant industry are being significantly impacted by the current situation, many of them um, now without work. Um, so Miller Lite, we've seen other campaigns from Jameson, um, even local campaigns in the Boston area. My uh, favorite local bakery, Vinyl Bakery, has opened up um, a donation site for individuals to provide donations to employees. For Miller Lite, they are opening up this virtual tip jar, um, which will benefit the Bartender Emergency Assistance Fund. They are providing $1 million in donations to kick off the effort, and then they're looking to consumers and individuals to tip their favorite bartenders online if they can't see them in person. And lastly, Kraft Heinz um, announcing a significant in-kind and cash donation. Um, so they're amping up their efforts um, to provide food to, to different nonprofit areas. In the US, they're partnering with Feeding America. In the UK, um, Magic Basket. And then in Canada, a, a number of different food banks. Um, what's interesting about this is that in tandem with this in-kind and cash donation, they're also launching a campaign called We Got You America. 
which is actually an internal rallying cry for their employees that are on the manufacturing lines um, to really increase production and know that they are part of providing a very critical service um, right now. So again, being creative about what it can mean to um, start with philanthropy, whether that's making a, a cash donation, a campaign that can motivate individuals to donate, um, or using your in-kind resources and determining where they can be best used. Um, I think this, this next uh, trend or area that we're looking at, caring for employees in uncertain times, is perhaps the most important um, place where a company can start. We need to protect our employees right now as best as we can. Um, we've fielded some research around how Americans believe companies should address coronavirus and be a solution provider. And what we're seeing in our initial data is that protecting and caring for employees is the number one way Americans want companies to get involved in this. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of people in this country that are very concerned about their jobs and their livelihood and ability to support their families. So a number of examples that we're seeing in the marketplace, there are so many to speak to. Um, we focused on Starbucks because they were one of the first movers in this area in terms of providing catastrophe pay for all employees, whether full-time or part-time. So this is two weeks paid sick leave um, for those that either had contracted coronavirus uh, or, or COVID-19 or had been um, around someone that had and, and needed to go into self-isolation. Here we're seeing that employees don't need to put pay over health. So this is a way that Starbucks was able to protect not only its employees, but also its consumer base by not putting um, people out there that, that might be sick or have, um, have been around someone that's been sick. In the next, next example, um, Walmart, one company working in this space, we're seeing a number of other companies stepping up, um, including Target and Kroger. I think that, you know, we just need to give an immense round of applause for individuals that are continuing to go to work every day in grocery stores or um, pharmacies or other very necessary um, occupations. And it's good to see companies provide bonuses for, to those that are quite literally on, on the front lines of this. So Walmart is actually providing bonuses for full-time and hourly workers. $300 for every single full-time worker and a $150 bonus for all part-time workers across this network. And lastly, um, I know a number of us are transitioning to remote working. It seems many of us here are on the screen and you can see my own remote work office for the moment here. Um, so Shopify really wanted to make sure that as its tra uh, workers transition to remote, that they were really comfortable and able to do their jobs to their best ability. So they provided a $1,000 stipend to each and every remote worker to make sure that they could get, you know, whether they needed a bigger screen or a more comfortable chair, um, to really make sure that they were comfortable and able to perform while transitioning during this time of remote working. The next bucket that we're going to dive in on is redirecting talent to create solutions. Um, so this is really thinking about you know, your talent, what are they skilled at? What are their expertise areas? And how can those concepts be transitioned to providing solutions or being a partner to nonprofits um, or other organizations? Um, I think one of the most um, shared articles that we've seen certainly in this space is um, a number of tech giants coming together. So Amazon, Alphabet, um, obviously the parent company of Google and Apple, coming together to create a coronavirus um, tracking site. So this is called uh, COVID Near You, and it's actually based on a flu tracking site, which had already been in the works. So 30 employees dedicated across these organizations to use their talent sets to address this. Um, they're working in partnership with the Boston Children's Hospital to make this happen. The next example, um, local organization, obviously up in Maine with a, with a pretty global presence, um, our client L.L. Bean. Um, so they have actually closed all of their brick and mortar stores in the U.S., um, but employees still wanted to be able to help. So specifically in their backyard where their headquarters is in Maine, um, they have transitioned their employees that are very skilled at packing and distribution to pack food 
for um, the Maine Food Bank. It's the largest food bank in Maine called Good Shepherd. So they're working closely with Good Shepherd to get meals and food to um, elderly and at-risk individuals that probably cannot make it to the grocery store um, to get, get their food. Last example I'll share in, in terms of kind of redeploying talent, um, our client Shiseido, um, global um, makeup and skincare brand, they have a pretty robust employee engagement platform, um, which, which they use, and a lot of it is actually online. Um, they were leading up to an April event, which was going to be an in-person volunteerism event across their network, and they had to pivot pretty quickly to think about how they could still engage their employees, but kind of in a different way. Um, so they have served up a number of online volunteer opportunities for um, their employees, specifically so that they can feel that they're making an impact around the current crisis. So the last area I wanted to share today is around removing paywalls and increasing access. Um, obviously, you know, the, we're in a great time of transition. Many people are getting used to um, stay at home orders or working while their children are at home, um, trying to find a way to, to create normalcy in a time that seems very not normal. Um, so there's a couple, a handful of companies that are really kind of stepping up in this space. Um, Pop Sugar, an organization that was going to launch this Active by Pop Sugar app, um, when the time came to launch it, they decided to remove all paywalls. Um, so that they could really just provide this service to whoever just wanted to get active. Um, we've seen a number of different organizations remove paywalls to goods and services. As you see on the right-hand side here, LinkedIn is opening up a bunch of its online learning courses, especially about how to kind of work from home or work remotely, to provide that resource that would um, previously be behind a paywall. Um, the last example I think is pretty interesting, which is in the center of the screen here, is from Hyundai. They have relaunched their Assurance Job Loss Protection Program. Um, this is something that they first enacted back in um, 2008 during the Great Recession, um, and they have relaunched, um, which is basically a program to provide a little bit of a buffer for individuals that may lose their job. So for, with this program, anyone that had recently purchased a Hyundai car um, who has now lost their job um, Hyundai has offered to pay, make the car payments for those cars for up to six months. Um, so again, a way that an organization can support its consumer base, support its loyal fans um, during a time of, of really uh, growing economic uncertainty. So to just wrap up this section, I, I know I shared a lot of information and a lot of different examples, and this is really a moment, I, I just want to take a step back and, and recognize that these examples are a source of inspiration and I hope information that can help you think differently about how your business can be uh, a fuel towards more solutions around this issue. I also just want to recognize that all organizations are at very different stages um, during this time and have a diverse set of needs that need to be addressed. Um, so you may not be ready to put out the, the monetary donation. Um, perhaps there's ways that you can really rally your employees around an issue, whether it be online or um, on the manufacturing line. So I just want to acknowledge that, that, you know, we're, we're all at different stages in this process and we're, we're all have very different challenges that need to be addressed. If you do decide to move forward with um, a social impact campaign during this time, um, or be a solution provider, there's a number of things that, that we offer up as things to consider. Um, I think it's important first to kind of identify that need state. So start thinking about what are the issues that need to be solved for during this current crisis, not what are the assets that we have to offer. So think about it from the need state first, as opposed to your unique products and services. Once you've identified the need state, identify those unique issues that need to be addressed, then go and look at how are our products, services, operations, distribution networks, how can those be a solution to that need state, to that problem? And then from there, it's figuring out all the nuts and bolts, right? It's um, anticipating what you'll need to do to really operationalize this, like how do you actually make this work and what partners do you need to leverage? 
Um, and then think about how this can be built for the long term. Um, you know, beyond this week or this month, um, is this something that, that could be supported more long term? Um, and then lastly, um, we are a communications firm, but we do recommend proceeding very thoughtfully when promoting. Um, this is not a time to pat ourselves on the back, but to be more of a resource um, and a solution provider during a time where all of the globe is, is dealing with the same, same issue and same crisis. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be communicating. It is certainly very important to communicate, but just be thoughtful about how and when and why you're communicating. So I'm going to quickly share a few global, national, and local nonprofits um, that are acting in this space. This list is by no means exhaustive, but just a sampling of organizations that have specific COVID-19 or coronavirus funds or emergency response programs. Um, that are being implemented and leveraged. So you can see them on the screen here. Um, if you want to take out your iPhone and take a pic quick picture, um, you know, a number of different organizations that are getting involved in different ways, whether that's United Way providing um, food for the most vulnerable or um, working direct directly with the CDC Foundation. On a local perspective, again, wanted to highlight a few local organizations that are getting involved in the space. Um, Greater Boston Food Bank, obviously very critical um, as communities have stay at home food, uh, stay at home orders um, so that we can continue to get food to those um, that might be most vulnerable. And with that, um, I'll turn just quickly to a few communications tips and best practices. Um, it's, it's definitely difficult times for communications. Um, we as an organization are tracking um, media coverage and social media coverage around the globe. And we can tell you that the significant amount of the conversation today is focused around coronavirus. And so how do you communicate um, during a very crowded time with valuable information um, that can really help to enhance um, what your organization is doing and enhance how you're supporting community. So um, from an external perspective, um, a couple ways that we're really counseling our clients, um, if you haven't done so already, uh, assemble your crisis management team um, and really make sure that when you're doing this, um, that it is a cross-functional team. So think about HR, operations, communication, certainly senior management, um, those are some of the parties that you want to get involved to make sure that you're thinking about all aspects of your business and also all stakeholders that will be impacted by your communications channel. Um, designate an information hub. So this can be different internally or externally. Um, certainly, if you have an intranet, um, that's a great way to reach your employee base. Um, from an external perspective, you know, you might want to have a special section of your website or a special um, banner that can promote information and then potentially pulse out smaller announcements or real-time updates over social. Um, it goes without saying, be a resource, not a medical expert, unless your organization is a medical expert. Um, please use the counsel of uh, designated medical experts at this time um, if you are trying to pulse out health-specific information. Um, again, we talked about the importance of employees. It is critical at this time to utilize an employee-first lens for decision-making. Um, so any decision that you're making, think about how is that going to impact your employees, anticipate their questions, um, and anticipate how it might uh, impact their day-to-day -day job. Um, the last two pointers might seem self-explanatory, but I think are important to flag. Uh, certainly, this is not the time to be opportunistic. We've seen a number of organizations uh, trip up here. Um, it's also not the time to be frivolous. Um, so if you don't need to be communicating, maybe don't. Um, so think about that in terms of what kind of messaging you're putting out there. And lastly, this is probably the most, the most important thing I can share today, is be authentic, especially uh, most of you on the line you're here for a reason, you're part of conscious capitalism for a reason, you already are working towards a purpose mission or have a purpose lens. So make sure that is shining through right now, not only from a communications perspective, but most certainly from a decision-making perspective. Um, a couple internal communications tips and then I'll, I'll wrap it up um, and we can kind of pass on to Mike and the team. 
Um, but really, this is a time when you're looking to communicate with your internal employee base. Um, it's a time to lead with empathy. This is something that we're all dealing with on a very human level. Um, individuals are, are experiencing very different um, issues. Um, maybe they have a family member that has been impacted directly or themselves. Um, so it's extremely important to communicate with empathy, acknowledge the situation head on, um, so that we can kind of all be, all be together on this. Um, it's also important to listen to your employees. What are they asking for? What questions do they have? What needs do they need to be met? And then think about how you can reinforce your existing culture. I know for a lot of organizations, this is a time of immense change. Um, whether there have been layoffs at your organization, you're, you're thinking about how to keep employees on, or even just the transition to a fully remote work culture. Um, what is your existing culture and how can you reinforce that today? Um, and a couple other tips I'll just share. Diversification of communications, if it makes sense. Um, you know, some people are feeling inundated by all of the messaging around COVID-19. Is there something else that you can share, maybe an uplifting story from a, a client or a meeting that you've had um, that can help people, you know, have a, a healthy distraction for a moment from the seriousness of the situation? Um, setting a communication schedule can be extremely helpful um, so people can know when to expect messages, whether that's a um, biweekly meeting with your whole team or maybe a senior leadership meeting, which is, which is taking place once a week. Um, and to that point, this is a time more than ever that individuals want to hear from senior leaders. Employees want to hear from senior leaders. So make sure that you're creating those touch points. Um, and they can be formal or informal. This is really a time, again, that we as, as individuals can, can reach each other on a very human level. So it's okay for senior leaders to, to be informal. Um, as we're doing today, at a time I think where we're feeling increasingly uh, isolated, video is such an important tool. Um, so where you can show your face, um, even if you're wearing sweatpants from you know, the bottom half down, um, it's an important time for us to, to feel connected, see each other, um, and, and really utilize um, video as much as you possibly can, Wi-Fi allowing. Um, and the last point, uh, again, kind of goes without saying, this is a time where we need to be extremely flexible. So make sure you're evaluating the situation. I have on the slide here weekly, it, it could almost be daily. Um, but looking at the situation and being flexible about how your organization is, is moving um, and knowing that it's okay to, to pivot. Um, this is a time where I don't think every organization is going to 100% get it right. Um, so understand that you have the, the flexibility to adjust um, if you need to. And with that, um, thank you for allowing me to share some of the, the research that we've pulled together, um, best practices. Um, if I can leave you with just one note, um, this is uncharted territory for every organization. As I said, we're all in different places um, right now, organizationally dealing with different challenges. Um, so as much as you can, lead with authenticity and lead with humility. Um, this is a, a, a moment that all of us can come together as individuals um, and corporate citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Whitney. It's uh... It's encouraging and um, inspiring to hear some of the examples that you shared and certainly helpful to get some of the ideas around communication. Um, I will say your comment on authenticity and humility makes for a really nice segue to um, lead into my introduction for Mike and Lucas at Grayston. Um, Mike Brady has been the CEO at Grayston for eight years. Uh, he believes that we are all one and that no one can succeed unless we all succeed. His TED Talk, Why We Hire Unemployable People, established a vision that led to the launching of the Grayston Center for Open Hiring in 2018. He's been selected to the inaugural list of top 100 meaningful business leaders in 2019. Uh, and Lucas Tanner has 27 years of diverse operating experience, both in for-profit and non-for-profit and he believes in everyone's potential to thrive. They, they both believe business can be a force for good in the world. Um, and they're also very clear in trying to articulate that they don't come to this conversation saying, hey, you know, we've got all the answers. They're uh, 
uh, wading through this just like the rest of us and trying to figure their way, but they're seeking to share and be open based on the experience that they've built over these years being focused on purpose. And you know, Grayston has provided over 3,500 job opportunities to the most economically disadvantaged people in the low income community of South Yonkers um, since uh, 82. And since 2012, they've grown by over 100%. So they've shown that they're able to be successful as a business while they're um, supporting and driving this purpose. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Mike and Lucas. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Whitney. I, 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 I knew when we were prepping for this, you were going to share some, some wonderful words of wisdom, and, and, and you absolutely did. Uh, and then, Bob, I'll, I'll thank you like I did before, just your willingness to keep this meeting in place and allow a forum for the community to get together. Uh, I, I've been on a few of these. I find it really invaluable to just be able to share a little bit and then ask questions and, and just have that kind of community and support of one another. So, you know, my interest is maybe just to give a little background on Grayston and uh, a little bit of what we're thinking about, hand it off to Lucas, who's been leading our crisis management team. We can provide a little more color, but then also allow that opening for others to ask questions or for us to discuss the things we, we haven't quite uh, been able to get our arms around. Uh, and so, in, in the bit of conversation I, uh, I'll have, um, if you people really want to deep dive on Grayston, I did do a keynote at a Conscious Capitalism event two years ago, I think it may have been, or three in Philadelphia, that's posted online. Uh, and it gets into our history and our incredible founder, Bernie Glassman. The, uh, the part that's important to this conversation, I think, is and what I would have been speaking about in more detail if we were in Boston uh, in person is around our model we call open hiring and this concept of inclusion. And you know, now that we are working uh, you know, every day to get through uh, the issues around the coronavirus, how we deal with our employees and how they're surviving, I was so, uh, Thankful to hear Whitney's comment that the number one issue she's seeing is that care for employees during this uncertain time is the most critical thing people care about. And frankly, that's what Grayston's been doing for uh, since 1982. Our model of open hiring is pretty simple to understand. People come to the front door of the bakery, they put their name on a list, we give them an opportunity, no questions asked. So we're not interested at all what people have done in the past, we're only interested what they're going to do in the future. So that means we do no background checks, no reference checks, no interviews. We give everyone a, a fair, equal chance to be successful on the job. And then the part that I, I want to talk about a little more about than I might usually is how we think about the wraparound support services so that I, as the business leader, am not, uh, you know, thinking unexpected, uh, uh, unreasonably that someone that may not have had a job recently or ever in their past knows what it means to come to work and be successful. So we have a model that we call path making where any employee is, is uh, provide the opportunity to explain what their, their challenges might be in coming to work or their challenges on the job, what they may be. And uh, we are, as an organization, all empowered to solve those problems. And it can be anything. So it can be how do you know my kids are in a crisis at school? I'm I, I'm struggling to find uh, affordable housing. There's no access to healthy food. I have a mental health issue. My my uh, my spouse has has some issues. I might be struggling with issues in the criminal justice system. We work to overcome all of those, knowing that we're all on our individual path. And as the business leader, I need my team members to come to work and be effective. And if they're not present because they're dealing with trauma in their own life, uh, I know they're not going to be able to come to work and be and deliver and make the brownies we need them to make. So this is, I believe, why this inclusive hiring model has such power. And then the other piece of that uh, that I want to kind of talk about, or at least pre present out there and see if there's more questions, is we've had a three-year relationship now with a nonprofit organization in Westchester County called Westchester Jewish Community Services. They're the largest social service provider in our county. 
and they provide what we call an employee path maker that is empowered to help us overcome these challenges. And they, along with Grayston's nonprofit, which is a unique model, but they went out and raised money for this initially so that they could provide that person to support our team members. There's a whole public private model here around if we can make sure these team members that may not otherwise ever get a chance to work can become thriving members of the community, it's a huge win for not only Grayston Bakery, it's a win for the team member and it's a, it's a win for the community. And in this case, also for New York State because those costs that may be incurred for people on the social service spectrum aren't, in, aren't incurred. So I'm thinking not only about how, I, how am I going to make sure I'm treating my employees today and ensuring that they're not in crisis or as best as possible, helping to ensure they're not in crisis. And this is the type of thing Lucas is thinking about and I'm sure all of you are thinking about it. I'm also thinking about the recovery so that as we come out of this, how are these practices not a one-time thing, but an ongoing opportunity for people to gain access to the workforce and then tap into the social services that might be available in the communities. Because I can tell you, it's, it's lovely like what Whitney was suggesting, if we had funds to donate to the nonprofits in our community, that would be awesome. But these nonprofits are also looking to support us. We need to, be, we need to be able to step forward and say, hey, we need help. Our team members are struggling. We're in crisis. We don't know what to do. Um, a couple of comments that Bob made around stakeholder leadership or conscious leadership and uh, servant-based servant leadership. I've been thinking about this idea of collaborative leadership. And there was a really good TED Talk by Lorna Davis around collaborative leadership. And, and the people have talked about collaborative leadership in the past around how we work with our team members. The part of collaborative leadership that I thought was really forward thinking that Lorna had, had shared in TED Talk was, we as business leaders today aren't big enough individually to solve the problems. We have to feel comfortable being able to say that and reach out to the NGO leaders in our community or reach out to other business leaders and say, I don't know how to do this. Can we work together to solve this? And, and the big examples are, are, you know, the visionary leaders like Paul Pullman, who knows he can't address environmental leadership or environmental issues just at Unilever. But if he parts with General Mills and he partners with the other major food players, how can they move the needle more effectively? And I think in the communities and things like conscious capitalism in Boston, these communities can really move the needle, but we need to be transparent and authentic and collaborative to say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. Can we maybe think about this homeless issue together? Can we maybe think about these things together? Um, and put in real KPIs and metrics to make those things happen. So anyway, I won't go on that, but it's a great TED talk. Uh, the woman's name again is Lorna Davis. Uh, and then the, the, the part that I, I'll, I'll go back and reinforce around the nonprofits, we know WJCS values that Grayston as a business reached out to them because they had been looking for ways to better utilize their own resources. So that outbound call to those organizations is critical. And they're looking for ways that they could write the grant on your behalf so that you can leverage what may be available in the markets to deliver the type of employee pathmaker services. And that we know from working with, with an organization that's based out of Boston, it's called G3. There are tons of dollars available, roughly between three to five per employee, regardless of your size, max out around $250,000 a year to do training and supportive models around inclusive hiring, like what, what, we're, what we're trying to su support and suggest everyone should be doing. It's the businesses work to tap into those dollars. They come from your, your unemployment payments. This is independent of everything that's already going on to perhaps pump new dollars into the system. This has been around, these, these dollars are available. There's apprenticeship dollars. There's, there's an initiative in, that's unique to Massachusetts. Um, I think it's called an express grant. $30,000 that you can use to train your team members around things like conscious leadership. It's, 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 a, it's a movement around public private opportunities that I think is just going to grow with what's, what's happening with the coronavirus. And we need to make it grow. We need to make sure the government is working with us 
as business leaders to say, our team members, if we're more progressive in our hiring, are gonna make our communities more healthy. They're gonna, they're gonna make the economy more effective. It's again, a win-win-win model. And if we draw it into this in initial conversation that Bob had approached us on, this is a purpose co concept that any business can infuse into its organization. So if you're looking for how to bring purpose, how to tap into the things that Whitney talked about, where the millennials are demanding that their organizations are driven by purpose, that consumers are looking for a story to be told by the organization, an authentic story, the way you hire, and maybe it isn't the entire workforce like Grayston Bakery, but it's just one person or a handful of people or 1% of your workforce or a commitment over time that says you're gonna think differently about how you work with someone. And I wanna to try to inspire you today to think about, hey, maybe as we're working through this crisis, I can develop some policies and procedures that will work for me in the future, ongoing, as I know my team members are in crisis and they're not able to get to work and they're struggling to find access to food. Are these things that might be useful beyond this period and when we're back into our recovery? So I can talk plenty more about that. Lucas, I see you're on the line. I'd love to hand it off. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about the things that we're doing at the bakery to make sure everyone's cared for and uh, sure, yeah. take some questions. Um, how many minutes do I have? Just real quick. Um, I'd say you got 10 to 15. Oh, okay, good. We have plenty of time. So real, I was just going to go over a little bit about um, what's happening at Grace in, in general now, excluding COVID, um, a little bit about some things that uh, we're seeing in the market in addition to the slides that we saw uh, by Whitney earlier. Um, there's a couple of facts that Mike didn't include that are my favorite facts about open hire, so I want to add those in there. Um, and then quickly talk about how we're handling COVID. Um, so real quick, at Grayston, um, you know, I, I know you guys know a lot about us, but um, at any time, we have about 70 open hires at our bakery. Um, and people come and go, but we onboard about 15 or 20 every year. Um, we're paying about $4 million of benefits and salaries to those open hires. Uh, today, uh, we're open um, six days a week, 24 hours a day. So we're, we're actively working now and we're considered a critical food company. There's actually, uh, you know, hard to find happiness here, but people are buying lots of ice cream at home and eating it. And uh, Unilever has been ordering lots of brownies and people are enjoying them. And so um, <clears throat> the, the, there's been some statistics out of our bakery of the highest productivity levels we've ever seen in the history of the company. People are really proud to being part of um, the piece that they're doing even in this time. So you know, we're really, it's really thrilling. Um, in addition, just a, a few more quick statistics that you know, we do pay the open hires a premium to minimum wage. We give them medical, um, we give them paid, uh, paid time off as part of what we do. We give them paid training days every year, three or four. Um, and then Mike talked about the social, uh, the social worker who assists these issues. Um, <clears throat> and one other big benefit is that, you know, in the Center for Open Hiring, which Mike launched, um, we've seen other companies adopt what we do. Um, so what one of the, the facts that uh, Mike didn't include is that, you know, how to open hires improve. And uh, Whitney talked a little bit about businesses want to work with companies that have a purpose, a better purpose. Um, but what we've seen in um, other companies is that they've seen higher productivity rates. There was a study released by the body shop where they had 13% um, higher productivity uh, rates in their fulfillment warehouses for picking and packing shipping goods. Um, they also had a 60% reduction in turnover rates. Um, and, you know, I think it was Bob pointed out that we've, you know, doubled our revenue over the last eight years when Mike's been the CEO. Um, but, you know, the company performs extremely well with the culture that's been created by these, uh, these people who haven't had opportunities to work and are seeking to work. So it isn't charity, it is workforce development, and we've been able to build a company that um, performs really well because people want to be there, they want to work, they're grateful to work, and the combination of support services we um, have put in place have actually built a, a highly effective, successful team. So I, I just wanted to add that. Um, 
what what uh, one other one other thing Whitney didn't catch this one because it just came out, but uh, Unilever put together um, a five hundred million dollar fund for its small suppliers that it wanted to protect uh, and help during this time. Um, fortunately, Unilever is also ordering products for us. Um, who knows how the next week month uh, will go? But for right now, um, they're continuing to support us by making sure our supply chain on the demand or on the supply are, are not um, impacted by what's happening. So we're fortunate that business can, can go on at the immediate moment. Um, so COVID-19, what's happening? So, you know, Whitney gave lots of great information. Um, we've been having daily communications by a team of people that are reminding um, people of what, how to take care of themselves, about the steps that we're taking internally. Um, we have a complicated organization, as Mike was pointing out, because we do have a bakery, but we also have, um, you know, other programs, some of which are open and some of which are not. And so different people in the organizations are now working in different ways. Um, so I would say that on the COVID-19, um, different people at our organization have time to digest information, are watching the news, are not watching the news, don't know how it impacts them. So what we've been doing is having um, a, very, a very large amount of communication to explain to different people, either the open hires or other people, you know, how we care about them in an authentic voice, what we can do, how we can protect each other, how we can work together, and why what we're doing and why we're supporting each other is important. Um, so I think that's great. One personal uh, victory that I feel like I've had is I do have a big technology background and it's been very hard to get people to embrace Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Skype, collaborative work, remote work, and all of a sudden the entire organization within two weeks of time has become highly capable in remote work. And so uh, I've been thrilled because that's been able, uh, that's created the ability to communicate um, in, in easier ways. We, we had a happy hour the other night and it looked just like the screen. I don't know if everyone is on the same screen I'm on, which is everybody's picture, but we, we had a happy hour that looks kind of like the screen that we had on here. And People had drinks from home and we all laughed and talked about the day. Um, and we've, we've been having virtual meetings continuously with different people throughout the organization to make sure we are all staying connected. And as Mike had pointed out, we do have a team that sort of fills in on the news, the latest, the latest CDC, Department of Health information that can be helpful because not everyone has time, especially people who are, are you know, working in the bakery, but to, to find out the latest news and how it impacts them. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, as far as, you know, hazard pay and, and that, which you had pointed out, Whitney, we're, we're considering and developing a program and a plan internally, but I, I don't have information to release on that, but we are, you know, we are grateful and supportive of the people who are working at this time. Um, we do want to keep our businesses opening and operating. So we're continuously looking for, um, flexible ways to be innovative, be it virtual online, if they're for our programs. Um, and then just the best, most safest work environments if it's going to be you know, in our manufacturing. So that's the quick update at Grayston across uh, what we're doing and how our suppliers are helping us and how COVID-19 is impacting us. Great, thank you, Mike and Lucas, uh, both for sharing your perspective and your experience. Uh, it is, it's inspiring um, to hear your story and to know that you're doing the work and having the impact that you're having in the world. Um, so with that, we wanted to give uh, those of you who are here joining the community today an opportunity to ask a question. So we're shifting into our Q&A format. So there's a couple things you can do. One, you can um, raise your hand in the participant bar. So if you can find that, uh, you can uh, click to raise your hand, which indicates that you've got a question. You can also just raise your hand on the screen if you happen to be visible on the screen. I know that we've got many people who are um, not visible because they're just simply on the telephone line. Um, but you can also write into chat if you've got a question as well. And so um, I see uh, Whitney and Mike and Lucas are still here and ready. So. Um, while those are queuing up, um, I'm going to ask a, start us off with a question, and, and I guess this is probably more for Mike and Lucas, but um, one of the things that, that I've run across in, in working with a variety of different companies is 
is the, the tension that they see between performance and purpose. And that there's a sense that, well, if I'm going to be purpose oriented, I'm going to sacrifice my performance. Uh, and if I'm going to be performance oriented, I need to sacrifice my purpose. And I guess I'd just be curious, you know, how does that show up at Grayston? How have you uh, experienced that, uh, if at all? And, and what do you make of that tension? Uh, I'll, I'll take it on first. I mean, it, it's, it's a real tension, uh, but in, in part, that's why having a purpose and a mission that you're committed to makes the tension a little easier to manage, right? It, if at the heart of it, as Grayson is, our North Star is ensuring our team members have an opportunity to thrive, and I, and I really like the way we've taken to describing thrive, which is there are, the opportunities tomorrow look better than the opportunities yesterday. So it's a small increment and it, and it indicates everyone may be in a different position. But as then we think about what we should do, we can always go back to that purpose and it helps us to make our decisions more quickly and more efficiently. Uh, you know, Whitney, Whitney alluded to it, I see you're shaking your head. Like people can say lots of things, but if their actions don't represent what they're saying, they're not really purpose driven. So that tension really doesn't need to be there. If you are purpose driven, the tension goes away. Yeah, of course we're gonna do this. How do we do it? It becomes the time and, and the effort that you put into, not if you're gonna do it. That's great, thank you, Mike. Um, we do have a, a question from uh, Shell. You raise your hand if you wanna ask your question. Yeah, this is to all of three of you, but perhaps particularly to Whitney. Um, many of your suggestions are geared toward larger organizations. What advice do you have to the solopreneur or very small consulting company at this time? Whitney's on mute, hmm. Kelly. I will take care of that. There you go, Whitney. Thanks for that. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, thank you for that question, Shell, and, and that's something that we actually discussed prior to the call. Um, but I think for, for smaller organizations um, or individual entrepreneurs, um, thinking about how your unique skill sets and expertise area um, could be a solution or um, joining, joining partnership with a nonprofit or a, you know, a larger organization to provide a resource if, if you want to pursue that. Um, I think that, you know, this is all hands on deck. Um, so thinking about how your, your talent set or skill set or unique value proposition um, at any size can, can really help to support. Um, I, I've seen a number of amazing inspirational campaigns from local businesses. Um, Rebel Rebel, a wine shop in Somerville. Um, very active in the community. Um, the owner of it has spent hours and hours and hours just compiling all the information that she can find on how to support non, uh, uh, small businesses and small business grants, small business loans, what are the resources? And she's making all of her research available online to other organizations. So that is her small you know, input into a larger problem, but um, you know, an issue that, that many local businesses are dealing with. So just sharing that information is, is really being um, supportive to the entire community. Hey, Shell, you're on mute. Uh, there, okay. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of encouraging, for example, on my Facebook feed to people to support local businesses now buy their takeout, buy their gift certificates. And I personally stopped shopping on anything larger than our food co-op. Um, um, but you know, as somebody, my, my consulting company is called Going Beyond Sustainability and it's just me. So I've always been about partnering with, with different organizations of different sizes. Um, and I've taken some one service that I used to offer in person for the last 35 years. I've just gone virtual with it because it's something specifically for job hunters. And at this time, they have a great need. So I'm glad to be able to do that and think out of the box. 
That's great. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, we do have another question that from Tara. She is asking, has, how has open hiring led to increased diversity at Grayston? Mike or Lucas, do you want to take that one? Mike, you want to do that one? That's a tricky question. I mean, I might make a quick comment and then and then hand it. When you, um, you know, we are hiring the people who have need um, in Southwest Yonkers. The people who have the most need in Southwest Yonkers um, are, you know, are are people who fit a demographic that are that are endemic to the population of Southwest Yonkers. So. When we talk about what that diversity means, um, uh, you know, we're not seeking specific diversity, but we are attacking social injustice that has put a lot of these people in the in the predicament that they are in. So that's my just initial setup for Mike to go ahead and, you know, adjust it some more. <laughs> yeah, that that question comes up a lot, and maybe it can be asked again in, in a different way. But oftentimes, I when I'm talk about diversity, I, I am by, by no means an expert in diversity. I am an expert in inclusion. And I encourage people to make sure that they separate those elements. Diversity and inclusion are not the same things. And I've actually now been hearing a lot more of that and the movement towards inclusion, the true embracing of people with different backgrounds to solve and, and, and get problems solved in your business is something that open hiring and inclusive hiring model is incredibly valuable for. Um, so kind of to Lucas's point, we, we don't have as diverse a, a, a team or we don't focus on diversity, but we are very focused on inclusion. Great. Thanks for, for answering that. Um, looks like we have another question from Debbie. Debbie, I just unmuted you if you want to ask your question. Okay, good. You just unmuted me. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you to our, uh, our speakers. This was just terrific. And I have a question, or my question, I'll, I'll direct it to Lucas, uh, based on, um, you know, on what you were saying about uh, productivity at this point in time. And you said that, uh, you know, the... Uh, company was experiencing its highest, I guess, productivity of all time of baking. Yep. And I was wondering if those that are doing the baking are aware of this. And, and also in, in this case, are you, um, you know, kind of the indirect relationship, are you generating heightened revenues from this or, or are you giving away more, you know, more product or how is that working? Sure, those are great questions. I mean, we, um, we do celebrate the high productivity days um, on a daily basis and the teams know what they do. Um, it's a very modern factory with the capability of knowing exactly what we do. Um, and a lot of the team members um, you know, are applauded and commended for the, the great work they do. So that's on a daily basis, people know that and that's communicated. Um, you know, more, more productivity does mean more revenue. Um, I mean, you could have one great day and then not be busy the next, but if you're on a trend of ever growing, which we have been growing consistently, um, over the last, uh, you know, well, since our beginning, but, um, that incremental revenue really then drives the other programs that are part of Grayston. So when Bernie Glassman founded the Grayston Bakery, he was looking for a business that he could have other people work in that didn't require a broad skill set. And he thought that baking brownies would be one of the most fun, delicious ways, but also a, an easiest way to get people into the workforce. Mm -hmm. So the, the incremental profits we have now go into our other workforce development programs at Grayston, which include things like our Ranger program, which is a reentry program, for returning citizens, it includes other workforce development programs and also supports our ESUN house, which is our supportive housing for people with HIV. So incremental revenue just means more programs. Um, and for those who don't know on the, on the call, the bakery is a for-profit bakery, but it's owned entirely by our nonprofit entity. So any profits that the bakery has driven by incremental performance, we then just put into other programs to support. Um, either Southwest Yonkers or growingly uh, into other companies through our Center for Open Hiring. So we want to perform, but no one, it doesn't it benefit individuals, it just benefits our community and our mission. Um, yes, but thank you, Deborah, for your question. Thank you. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. If I, if I could add to that too, I, I, I believe and I'd like to think going forward that there, the hybrid nature of Grayston will become a more common practice. It's mm -hmm. not easily managed, but whether you own the, the nonprofit that's connected to it or you're deeply connected to a nonprofit, those elements really allow for great flexibility in the way you can serve a community. Uh, Grayston has a long history there. I, just to go back to Tara's question too, because I see it here on the chat. Uh, over the, the, the 38 years that Grayson's been operating, our, the makeup of the team has changed pretty dramatically from what was once nearly 100% African-American to now having a much greater, uh, close to 50% uh, Latino population because of the immigration that we've seen in Southwest Yonkers. Now, everyone in open hiring needs to have a, um, uh, needs to be able to work, legally work in the state. Uh, but we find that a lot of people come to the bakery and need opportunities because they have no work history and others are not giving them the opportunity to get into the workforce. So if you're thinking within your own organization and the purpose that you would like to put around an inclusive hiring model, oftentimes people think about it working with a formerly incarcerated, but it's much broader than that. It can be working with veterans. It can be working with, uh, recent immigrants, it can be working with single moms, can be working with, with retirees. All of these opportunities to provide people access to the workforce that might not otherwise get it. And then the services that we know again, back to the critical issues today, to make sure they're able to survive and thrive while on the job or on a downturn or whatever might be the, the situation. All right, so um, thank you for doing a little q and A. I'm still intent on the time that we've got to give us a chance to break out into small groups. And uh, before I do that, I just wanted to build off of what um, I heard referenced earlier about supporting local organizations. You, you probably saw earlier when we did the introduction about our eight corporate members. One of those corporate members is Boloco, uh, which is a, they, uh, serve delicious burritos and bowls and uh, right now they're experiencing a real challenging time and if you go on Twitter you'll see uh, John Pepper who I believe is on the line um, has indicated you know the severity and the depth of that challenge and uh, a call for those who are in the area I'm going to encourage you to go out and order a burrito uh, or a bowl for your family if you can they do both delivery and takeout so Anyway, they're a, a member of ours and have been a great contributor and appreciate them. So uh, in the breakouts, we're going to break. All right, thanks. Uh, <laughs> our group is, uh, we got a few left. So why don't, um, I guess, first thing, I just want to say thank you to the speakers. I think you've left us all with some um, sense that we have uh, choices that we can make, actions that we can take to be intentional about uh, serving uh, challenges and the people and the community around us um, it, while we're running uh, successful businesses. And so thank you for that and that it's actually good for business. So um, appreciate not only what you've shared, but also the example that you're setting in the work that you're doing at your companies. Um, I want to thank uh, thank all the attendees for showing up. Uh, I appreciate that, um, particularly since I know everyone has a variety of things on their mind and that they're attending to right now. So I really appreciate you all being here and certainly wishing you all the best of health and safety and uh, that you can get through this like all of us, uh, that we can get through it okay.